students today on the conceptual orthopedics platform we are going to discuss infections of the hand i have designed this lecture integrating the anatomical facts with the applied surgical anatomy as is relevant to the management of infections of the hand and it is my advice to all the students to be well versed with the anatomy and the resource book that i would recommend for this is uh, the synopsis of limb anatomy by a lee magrecker i am sure this book would be available in the libraries of your institution please refer to it as far as hand infections are concerned it may be a source of considerable morbidity and an expeditious treatment is therefore necessary for the individual patient to get back to work as early as possible before going on to discussion of the hand infections it is important to know the various risk factors and needless to say diabetes mellitus tops the list so in a diabetic patient the risk of infection as in other areas of the hand are also important similarly this patient presenting to you may have been attended to earlier by another practitioner may be a general practitioner so it is important to know what type of an antibiotic therapy has been instituted before the patient has presented to the treating orthopedic surgeon now is this patient on any type of steroid therapy it may be for the reason that the patient may be a bronchial asthmatic or he may be on steroids for a rheumatoid like pathology is this patient otherwise immunocompromised does he have hiv infection or is he a habitual iv drug abuser all this information is important for the overall management of the infected hand as far as the various mechanisms for the hand to get infected are concerned it may be a work or home acquired infection as may happen with certain injuries which can occur or which can happen while working in the kitchen encountered by housewife in these situations usually a single gram positive species of organisms is responsible on the other hand patients who suffer from animal bites or human bite they may be iv drug abusers or in diabetic individuals usually polymicrobial infections are common in other chronic indolent infections one should consider the possibility of tubercular or fungal infections carefully the types of infection which we are going to cover in this lecture today are listed here the cellulitis peronychia a felon a subcutaneous collar stud abscess septic flexor tenosynovitis deep palmar space infections infective arthritis and osteomyelitis as far as cellulitis is concerned the diagnosis is primarily clinical uh, but my advice is that examine the hand closely to rule out any subcutaneous or deep space abscess or infection and do not forget 
to examine the joints for the possibility of uh, an infective, infected joint or infective arthritis. Well, as far as the management of cellulitis is concerned, a choice of oral or IV antibiotics is available. If the patient has to be treated on, in, uh, on the OPD basis, then it is advisable to start oral antibiotics. Whereas if the patient needs to be admitted for possible surgical intervention or if the patient is sick, seemingly very sick, then you need to admit the patient and it is better to institute intravenous antibiotics for the first three to four days with the hand elevated to reduce the swelling and active mobilization of the digits as far as the pain permits. Sprintage and frequent reassessment of the hand is usually required in such patients again for the possibility of deeper infection being there. Another very common infection is the runaround nail bed infection which is known as peronychia. It is an abscess which forms beneath the nail fold. It's extremely common. Staphylococcus aureus is the organism mostly detected in these cases and it may in later stages extend between the nail and the nail bed. On an early basis, if the patient comes to you when the pus formation is still doubtful, these patients can be managed with early soaks in antibiotic solution or in antiseptic solution. Institution of oral antibiotics can be started, but the patient should be warned that he may require an incision and drainage procedure. So if you look at this, the picture which is there, it shows you the evidence of involvement of the nail bed and the eponychium is lifted up. There is pus formation here and this is again depicted in the clinical picture which shows you obvious pus formation and this is the time when one should resort to surgical drainage of the abscess and how the, as far as surgical drainage is concerned uh, the incision can be given just juxtaposition in juxtaposition to the nail as has been shown in this particular slide or one can remove a part of the nail uh, which is the offending part of the nail uh, and a partial nail excision can be done to de-roof the abscess or the peronychial abscess. One can also resort to an excision of the proximal part of the nail by reflecting the eponychium as has been depicted in this particular diagram and the de-roofing of the abscess is achieved by inverting the nail bed and after cleaning out all the debris, a petrolatum gauze dressing can be done as is depicted in the last picture on the bottom. As far as the anatomy of the finger and the pulp is concerned, it is important to note that the digital artery on both the sides supplies two branches which are supplying the distal phalanx of the finger. The proximal of these two arteries supplies that portion which is the which was the epiphysis of the of the distal phalanx and it is known as the epiphyseal blood vessel whereas 
the distal blood supply is through another branch which is traveling through an area which is traveling through an area this area which is the proper pulp of the digit it is peculiar in its construction because there are fibrous septi which are traversing from the skin onto the bone skin onto the bone and several of these septi have fat in between and this renders the pulp inexpensile it cannot accommodate much of pus if it accumulates there and in case there is an infection and pus collection in the pulp area what happens is the terminal diaphyseal blood vessel supplying the distal pharynx gets compressed and this can create an avascular necrosis of this part of the distal pharynx whereas the epiphyseal blood vessel does not traverse through the pulp which is unaccommodating and that is why the proximal part of the pharynx distal pharynx remains unaffected this anatomical fact is very important when treating pulp space infections and abscesses which are known as a felon and this sort of a abscess formation here obviously needs drainage or release release of pressure as early as possible by giving an incision and the incision is marked here which you can see is more towards the dorsal aspect so it is at the junction of the volar volar and the dorsal skin it is just in juxtaposition to the nail keeping in mind the fact that the blade of your knife should be traversing an area which is dorsal to the dorsal to the neurovascular bundle otherwise it can injure the neurovascular bundle which is not desirable and the moment you hit upon the collection of the pus there is a release of pressure and the blood supply to the terminal branch of the distal pharynx is restored and the avascular necrosis is prevented 